Monday morning to everybody. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Barry Blow. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Chen. Good morning, BJ Reiner and Formula Q1. How are you guys doing? Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Do you guys want to see... Uh, a really funny mouse pad that my wife got me. Some of you will get this reference, others of you will be like, what the heck is that? Okay. Let's try to get this in here. Okay, pre prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Do you guys know what that's from? <laughs> Yeah, there we go, Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's my mouse pad now. Because <laughs> we, we watched uh, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. You know, when, when quarantine was starting. And Hannah had never seen any anime stuff. And I haven't seen, I'm not, I haven't seen like too much. I don't consider myself an anime uh, connoisseur. But I had seen Full Metal Alchemist before and I was like, this show rules. So we watched it and she loved it. What's up with the, what's up with the setup? Oh, you want to see like my setup? Sure, we can, we can do that. So we got um, we got the mic on this mic stand. Um, this is uh, let's see. This is so I have like my surface out. So I, I take notes on that, and then I look at. So I got two monitors, and this monitor I have the the Streamlabs thing, and then uh, and then I got another monitor. That I'll like use as a cheat sheet. That's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> His impeccable physique will give you something to strive for. It's been in the Armstrong family for generations. Yeah, you just got a doctor at this point of view. Oh, wow. We gotta update this title. Are you always standing when you do lectures? Yeah, I have been, um, for the time being at least. Yeah, this is like, we'll have to, I'll have to show you the desk. Uh, okay, I'm updating this title. Yeah, because I have this adjustable standing desk. My back's been bothering me recently. So I'm trying to like stand, like change positions or whatever. Um, how do you like your coffee? I love coffee with a good dose of heavy cream. I, I'm not ashamed of that. Um, 
did I catch the Bills game? I I actually did. We won, right? We beat the the um, Jets. Is it possible to turn down the volume of the background music a bit lower? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Let's do that. People who drink black coffee hate themselves? Shoot. Well, <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, you got to enjoy it a little bit. Throw some heavy cream in there. Throw some, uh, it's fall. Throw some pumpkin spice in there. Oh, it's, oh, it's okay. It's, it's Monday. It's not Friday. Shoot. Oh, uh, what if today was Friday, guys? <laughs> what if? Oh, shoot. It's not. It's Monday. It's the beginning of Monday. People who drink black coffee are tough as nails. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jenna's like, blah, 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 just slammed her keyboard and says, I wish it was Friday. Yeah, I understand. Okay, guys, so um, today we're going to get into the details of the equation of motion for a car. Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about bicycles. The Tour de France is going on. It's appropriate. Um, but now we're, we're going we're gonna to focus on cars. So th this will be cool because this will allow you to do a simulation of a race given a lot of details about a car. So you can predict how a car is going to behave. And that's going to be over our next two homeworks in your first group project, which I need to put up soon. But um, this gives you a lot of ability to predict what a car is going to do given the vehicle specs. Um, okay, so we're going to develop the longitudinal equation of motion for a car and we're going to incorporate rolling resistance. We're going to talk about that first. We're going to do a little bit on aero drag and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about the transformation of engine torque into tractive force because there's a bunch of steps through the drivetrain. So our model will not yet incorporate a slip ratio at the tires. That's what we're going to start next week when we get into some tire modeling. Um, so for now, we're assuming that the tractive force at the road is consistent with this rolling constraint that we've been using. So this basically means that however much friction you need to make the tire stick no matter what the torque is from the engine we're going to assume that the tires are going to stick that's not true in real life if you just full throttle the torque from rest you, you might spin out your tires all right let's get right into it here we go honda crv that's what i drive a high performance vehicle so let's let's label some forces here we're gonna put the tractive force at the front and the rear we're gonna focus mainly on rear wheel drive so the tractive force will mainly be generated at the back but you could have all-wheel drive and you could have some tractive force at the front well the tractive force in general is the friction force so this could be braking um, rolling force but the largest force happens when um, torque is being transmitted to that tire so that'll be a much larger force than or, or if you're braking, that's that's actually a huge tractive force. Okay, so we have those, and, and I'm having them point forward, assuming that we're accelerating right now forward. But at each set of tires, we're also going to have 
rolling resistance, which we'll talk about what that is next. Paul says, rear wheel drive Honda CRV. Is that what you drive? So we have rolling resistance at the front and rear track, and then we're also gonna have aerodynamic drag. Oh, there is none? <laughs> okay. All right, let's label these. Tractive force at front and rear track. Never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, probably doesn't exist, I guess. Okay, now when I say track, like the rear track, that's both rear tires. So front track, rear track, that's what that's gonna mean. Okay, this is rolling resistance at front and rear track. And then obviously F arrow is just the aerodynamic drag force. All right. So these are our primary sets of forces. The biggest force is gonna be the tractive force of the driven tires. All right, so let's combine all of these together into the most basic uh, Newton's second law. And then we're gonna get detailed expressions for each of these as we go. So you have Let's say tractive force at the front and the rear accelerating you. We're gonna have the rolling resistance fighting your forward acceleration. And we're also gonna have the aero drag fighting your acceleration. So the rest of these notes is, so this is our equation of motion, but we need to fill in some detailed expressions for exactly what these are. The most complicated is that tractive force. All right, let's get into rolling resistance. What is it? So rolling resistance is the primary dissipative force, meaning uh, it's, it's trying to slow you down for speeds roughly less than 60 miles per hour. So if you think that aerodynamic drag is the thing that's pushing you back uh, for, for usual uh, just driving around town. No, it's, it's the rolling resistance at the tires. It's only once we get up to, you know, for most cars, somewhere above 60 miles per hour that the aerodynamic drag becomes a bigger effect than the um, rolling resistance. Higher tire pressure for the when. Yeah, I guess higher tire pressure could resist rolling resistance i think that would make sense to me but then your contact patch might be it might not cover as much area i don't know there's there's some trade-offs here so what is rolling res what does it come from rolling resistance is primarily due to an asymmetric pressure distribution on the tire contact patch mostly at the driven tires you notice that when the water on your hood starts to bead off, tire pressure makes a huge difference. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let, let's, let's talk about what I mean by an asymmetric pressure distribution here. So I'm gonna make a little, I'm gonna make a little space. So the contact patch is where your tires in contact with the ground that makes sense so it's this isn't like a, a a sphere that's touching the ground at one point it's the bottom of your tire flat and this is exaggerated but the bottom of your tire flattens out across a surface of the road and it and it sticks there 
Now, when you roll the tire, wait, let's draw this first. If your car is just sitting on the road at rest, the pressure distribution on the bottom of the tire, it probably looks something like this. And I, I mean to draw this to be symmetrical. Now, what happens when you produce a, a torque about this axle, about this axle, um, what you get is some of the, the rubber, it starts to compress and bunch up at this front part of the tire. So I drew this with a, like a little bubble right here. And that's because as you're generating torque, you're driving this rubber into the ground and deforming it. And what that does with the pressure distribution is it makes it skewed towards the front of your tire. And then as these fibers like move back towards the back of the tire as it turns over, they relax a little bit. And uh, so there's less pressure over there. So the point is, if I take this asymmetric pressure distribution as I'm rolling, and if I boil it down to some resultant force, So I'll just call this like F resultant. You're gonna notice that it's off center from the middle of the tire or the wheel, whatever. So I'm gonna call this distance E sub N and it's the moment arm about the tire center and this fr once again this is just the resultant force from the normal load from the pavement so when you're rolling pressure distribution shifts towards the front of the tire why because you're deforming the rubber mostly towards the front and um, that creates this off-center resultant force if you apply that force over a moment arm which way does this tend to rotate the tire or it, it doesn't actually rotate it but it it produces a moment that goes back the other way so that's what rolling resistance is it's not like friction at the axle or something like that. It's, it's something from the tire. Okay, so the pressure is concentrated toward the front of the tire contact patch where the rubber is most compressed. This creates an off-center resultant force which produces a moment opposite the direction of rotation. So why don't we just write out that moment? Okay, pretty basic. The resultant force times that moment arm. Okay, so that's what causes rolling resistance and it's happening at all of your tires, especially at the driven tires. Now we tend to approximate the rolling resistance using an empirically measured rolling resistance coefficient. So in practice, we don't really derive this moment for a given car and a given tire you you run some experiments and you approximate the rolling resistance in this way so let's call rx the total rolling resistance from all four tires so that would be the rolling resistance from the rear track 
JD JD says, so go back to wooden wheels. Yeah, I think the way we're gonna improve this and, and reduce rolling resistance is forget using rubber and just go back to uh, wooden wheels. Yes. Okay, so you have the rolling resistance from the rear tires, from the front tires. And what we do is we simplify this as the rolling resistance coefficient times the weight of the car. So th this is just kind of the lazy man's way of approximating rolling resistance. So I'm not gonna rewrite that, but that's the rolling resistance coefficient right there. And that's the weight of the car. All right, we're gonna do an example now. So we're gonna be comparing the performance of a Tesla P100D to a Corvette ZR1. Wait, is it ZR1? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At each stage, we're gonna compare them. Oh, okay. And, and a typical value of this coefficient is something like 0 0.015, if you're wondering. So if you're wondering what the rolling resistance is for your car, how much resistive force you get, run a calculation like this. Get the weight of your car, multiply it by 0 0.015. That's how much force the rubber is pushing back on you. All right, let's compare A, the rolling resistance for a Tesla versus a Corvette. Now, some of you probably know this, Teslas are heavy. They are super, super heavy. Like it's, it's heavy, I mean, it looks like your, your typical sedan. It's heavy as like a, a big Ford truck. Compare it to the uh, the ZR1 here, it's it's 1,300 more pounds, right? So yeah, Gary nailed it. It's it's the battery. The battery on a Tesla is right down here at the bottom, and that's that's why it has such great rollover performance as well because its center of gravity is so low to the ground, it's impossible to tip the thing over. Um, okay, but it but it's super heavy. So let's use this simple approximation for rolling resistance. So what you do is you take the weight of the car. So I'm going to take 2250 kilograms. Uh, let's transform it into weight by multiplying it by gravity. And then you multiply that by the rolling resistance coefficient. So let's just say it's typical 0.015. This is 331 newtons. So we, we should expect less from a Corvette simply because it weighs less, at least according to this approximation. So we're just multiplying the weight by that rolling resistance and you get just shy of 300 newtons. Are we always going to assume the rolling resistance is 0 0.015? This is like a typical value. Um, I don't think we'll deviate too far from this. And this doesn't take into account the slip ratio at the tire, which is a measure of how much it's deformed. No, this is... This approximation is for the whole car right here. This is not per tire because this formula of the coefficient times the weight, we're using this as an approximation for the total rolling resistance. Wouldn't the Corvette have a much higher rolling resistance coefficient because the tires are super wide? Well, I think from this perspective, it would be, um, even though the tires are wider, they're not being deformed as much because the car weighs less. 
And we know that the deformation of a tire is going to change depending on how much torque is at that tire. So this, this is this is a, a big simplification. It doesn't take into account that. It's just kind of taking the static load of the car and. So the coefficient is supposed to capture some of that variability. So you'd have to run some experiments. All right, that's rolling resistance. That's about as complicated as we're going to get with that. Aerodynamic drag. So we're gonna compare the aero drag of the Tesla and the Corvette. So you've probably seen this formula before. Drag force is usually calculated in this way, one half times your air density rho times your drag coefficient C sub D times your frontal area A and then you have this term squared. Would a slimmer tire have lower rolling resistance coefficient? What do you mean by a slimmer tire? Like a, a, a thinner sidewall? Okay, and then you have the vehicle velocity plus some oncoming wind squared. thinner sidewall I assume that a thinner sidewall tire at lower torques would have less rolling resistance that's my gut instinct if, if the car we're assuming the weight of the car isn't changing all right here's your aerodynamic drag so just looking at this we want to reduce drag to improve our acceleration. So if we can reduce our drag coefficient, that's good. That's a function of the geometry. If we can reduce our frontal area, that's good. If we can reduce the density of the air around us, which we can't do, you just have to live with that. Is X dot and V wind positive in opposite directions? Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm considering magnitude here. Do we need to consider the projection of front area or just the area? Now, it depends on the experiment they did when calculating the coefficient of drag because the coefficient of drag is related to a given area. Um, I, at least what we're gonna do, and I think this is, this is fine, is you just take a, it should be the projected area, but you can just take the rectangular box that forms an envelope for the for the front of the car so yeah these are magnitudes here the velocity and the wind velocity so the wind v wind that's how much like uh wind relative to like a fixed frame is just blowing in your face like we got 20 miles per hour wind today or whatever and then obviously if you're going 40 miles per hour into a 20 mile per hour headwind, then it's, we're gonna have those two added together and we square that. In this class, we'll usually just deal with, let's assume it's a calm day and you just have the vehicle velocity that's contributing to aero drag. All right, let's go back to the Tesla and the Corvette ZR1. Using this formula, let's compute the the drag force at 60 miles per hour we're, we're going to assume no oncoming wind now if you look at the drag coefficient for the tesla and if you go to their website i think at one point this was the lowest drag coefficient of a commercial vehicle you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I remember them like advertising that on their website. Like it's a super low drag coefficient. Uh, a Tesla is very aerodynamic in terms of its geometry. So like the ZR1 has a significantly higher drag coefficient. Um, okay. Now what I'm gonna do 
I'm gonna approximate the frontal area as the height times the width. So we're just saying this is like a rectangle. Barry says the Tesla truck, on the other hand. Yeah, I wonder what the drag coefficient is on the Tesla truck. I know that's very aerodynamic as well. Okay, so let's do the Tesla first. The arrow is going to be one half times, let's take this sea level density. You know, we're just cruising in San Diego. The Tesla truck, 0.35. Okay, so a P100D Model S, much lower drag coefficient than the truck. All right, so we got the density of air. Multiply this by the drag coefficient, 0.23. Most trucks are actually above 0.45 to the, okay. So that's a good comparison. This is like half the drag coefficient of your typical truck. All right, and then let's do a simple area calculation. We're just gonna assume a box. So one half density, uh, drag coefficient area, The front area of the car is just the part of the car that hits the wind first, or that part plus windscreen. The area is, if you look at the front of the car like this, and you project, like if you were to take the shadow that the Corvette makes, that's typically what we'll use. So even the little side mirrors. Okay, now we need to multiply this by the velocity squared. If we're doing everything in metric, that's 26.82 meters per second. And then we gotta square it. <clears throat> okay, so at 60 miles per hour, this would be 319.6 newtons. That's why height times width, yes. Um, if you compare this force to the rolling resistance earlier, we had around, we approximated 330 newtons of rolling resistance. So that, that shows that if we're using that approximation of rolling resistance, um, this like 60 mile per hour rule kind of holds where above 60, the arrow drag starts to catch up with the rolling resistance. So you just add up X dot and VW, directions don't matter. Directions do matter. Directions do matter. Um, I, I see what you're saying, because I said magnitude, right? I, I'm assuming when, when we talk about the velocity of the wind here, I'm assuming that this is wind that is oncoming. It's like blowing at your windshield. If it was behind you, it would actually be helping you out. So, um, so just keep that intuition in mind. Okay, let's do the Corvette. This might surprise you. This might surprise you. So I won't show all the numbers, but I'm just gonna jump right to the result. The Corvette experiences less aerodynamic drag at 60 miles per hour. And at higher speeds, that'll only get better for the Corvette. So you might be asking yourself, wait, 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 wait. The Tesla has this killer drag coefficient. It's much better than the Corvette. How could, yeah. It's because of the frontal area. The projected area of a Tesla is more than the projected frontal area of the Corvette. Like if you look at this, uh, this Corvette, it's not as wide and it's, it's closer to the ground. It's not as tall. 
So even if you don't have the most aerodynamic geometry, if you can shrink the car a little bit, it'll reduce that drag. So even though the Tesla touts a great drag coefficient, that's, that's not the end of the story when it comes to aero drag. All right, so we're gonna get started. So, so we have rolling resistance, we have aerodynamic drag. Now we're gonna get into tractive force, which is gonna take a decent amount of time. And we're gonna try to finish this up by Wednesday, and then we're gonna go into a cool example on Friday. So tractive force, we're gonna, at the end of this, we're gonna get a, a, an expression for tractive force as a function of engine torque. If you have information about the vehicle's drivetrain or powertrain. So the drivetrain or powertrain is the collection of components connecting the power generator, which, which is your engine. I say power generator because um, we're gonna do an electric drivetrain a little later, which is simpler <laughs> than, um, than an engine in your gas driven car. So I'm trying to keep this a little generic here. So the powertrain is the collection of components connecting the engine to the tire road interface. So the thing that carries power from the engine to the place that ultimately produces tractive force. So let's go into the typical powertrain components for a gas powered car. I stole this figure from a really great road vehicle dynamics book, Gillespie, Fundamentals of Vehicle Dynamics. So here's the front of the car. We have the engine, which produces power. And we talked already, you know, power is torque times speed. Then the engine, so it, it has an output shaft it's connected to a transmission via a clutch for manual transmission or a torque converter for automatic transmission. And we'll focus mainly on manual. So the engine is connected to the transmission via a clutch. And the transmission is the housing of the gears which we can adjust, and we, we discussed this last week, that the point of these gears is to try to allow the engine to operate at a speed where it produces its most power and torque effectively. So we're gonna choose gears that maximize acceleration ultimately, and, and we'll, we'll get to that. So the transmission, Output shaft connects to the drive shaft. So this is rotating. And the drive shaft, so it's rotating about this X axis. Well, we need to go about this Y axis to, you know, get the tires to spin the way we want. And the differential, where is that? Oh, here we go. Is the mechanism responsible for diverting this power flow from about this axis to about that axis. And then the axle connected to the rear tires. So this is rear wheel drive. It's gonna spin those up and then we're gonna have a tractive force produced, oops, at the back. All right, so that's, that's just a real quick and dirty run through. We're gonna break it down though. We're going to break it down. So I'm making a little another simplified schematic um, but I'm defining goodness gracious so we can't even fit it all on one screen here but I, I'm showing this engine up here at the top and then we're gonna break this down how the power flows ultimately to produce some tractive force back here Okay, let's let's do this this way. We'll keep coming back to this picture. 
But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these things one by one, starting with the engine, and we're going to do a sum of moments. So we're going to use Newton's laws. And Newton's laws is what's going to connect all of these things together to, re to relate the tractive force to the engine torque. So let's start with the engine. And then we'll, I'm gonna throw some YouTube videos in here that are really fantastic. But let's just start with the engine and then I'll show you a video on, um, on the clutch in a second here. All right, let's do some sum of moments. So your engine has some inertia. And Newton's law says that the inertia of your engine times its angular acceleration is equal to the sum of torques. So when combustion is happening, that's producing a torque that's that's spinning your engine. But let's say we have the, the engine shaft over here. So this is spinning. This is going to connect to the clutch, which is gonna create a resistive force that the torque of the engine has to fight. So, that's, that's gonna go uh, the opposite way. Okay, now before I show you this video on the clutch, I wanna show you the transmission. And there's this video from I think 1938 or something that I think we'll finish the class with today. And it's just, it's just fantastic. Um, so let's, let me break down this picture really quick. Okay, so you're gonna have the engine over here. And then um, you're gonna have clutch, which we'll watch another video to describe that in detail. And then here is the transmission input shaft. So the clutch connects the engine output shaft, which is spinning. It connects it to the input shaft of the transmission. And then you see these gears here. So the input shaft is connected via gears to the this lower shaft that goes across, which is called the counter shaft. And then depending on which gears are in mesh over here, we have different gear ratios transmitting to the output shaft of the transmission. Okay, let's watch this video on transmission from 1930 something and it's just fantastic. It's just fantastic. You're gonna love it. Okay, let's go. Oh no. You guys are gonna love this. Meet Mr. Archimedes of ancient Greece. Long ago, Archie said, give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. What Archimedes meant was that the power of a lever is practically unlimited. Today, almost everyone uses some form of lever in his daily work. The familiar can opener is a lever with a sharp cutting edge. The playground seesaw is just a simple lever too. It takes a lot of force to start a freight car moving, yet the railroad man can start the heaviest freight cars easily with a pinch bar a powerful lever which turns the wheel. Tough luck, old boy. Here's a place where a lever comes in mighty handy. Let's take the simplest kind of lever, a rigid bar working on a fixed support called a fulcrum. One end of this lever 
is twice as long as the other. Let's put a 10 pound weight on this end and now we'll put half as much weight on this end. Five pounds, balance 10. If we have 25 pounds to lift, we just use a longer lever. The five pounds will now balance five times as much. Let's raise the lever in the air, change its shape a little, and we have a crank. Or we can add a second lever and have a double crank. Now the short arm moves one fourth the distance, but we get four times the force. If we want continuous motion, we need more arms. Now we have levers that turn. The larger paddle wheel makes fewer turns, but it delivers more force. A paddle wheel is nothing but a never ending series of levers. We can make the wheels stronger and lessen friction where the wheels touch each other by rounding off the edges and shaping them into teeth that will slide in and out smoothly. That's a beautiful now, transition. Now, the power flows smoothly and continuously through spinning leverage of gear wheels. Gears are made in many kinds and many sizes. Little gears, big gears, worm gears, bevel gears, and even lopsided gears. Over a hundred million gears are spinning over the roads in the transmissions of our automobiles. The transmission is located right at the bottom of the gear shift lever. Let's start from scratch and put together a model of the gears that we shift See, this, in this our motor car. See, this is the great car. part of this video. The shaft on the left comes from the engine. The shaft on the right carries the power back to the rear wheels. To connect these two with gears, we'll need another shaft, known as a counter shaft. These two gears carry the power from the engine shaft to the counter shaft and are always connected or in mesh. This gear on the drive shaft going to the wheels is free to turn around the shaft. We'll put it in mesh with another gear on the counter shaft. These gears are always in mesh. and keep turning while the engine is running. To switch from one set of gears to another, our transmission needs a short shaft like this, known as a clutch sleeve. It cannot turn on the drive shaft, but it is free to slide back and forth. On the sleeve, we'll mount a large gear which we can shift back and forth to mesh with the small gear in the middle of the counter shaft. We are now in neutral. The gears that are always in mesh are turning over with the engine, but the shaft to the rear wheels is standing still. A 3,000 pound automobile takes a lot of force to start. So this is like so shifting in into speed, first gear. We get the greatest leverage by letting the smallest gear on the counter shaft turn the largest gear on the drive shaft. The engine on this model is running at a constant speed of 90 revolutions a minute. With low gears in mesh, the rear wheel is turning at 30 revolutions a minute, about a third the speed of the engine, but with three times the force. The gears in mesh so just like a quick pause here, like, so in a car, the engine is usually spinning much faster than the tires, unless overdrive, somebody mentioned that. This is opposite from a bicycle where you're pedaling slower than the real rear wheels are moving. The rear wheel is turning at 30 revolutions a minute. So in a car, a usually the, the rear wheels the are engine, spinning. But with three yeah. times the force. The power is going through these gears in the transmission. After we've started the car rolling, we want I mean, fast we won't pickup. learn um, So we shift into second by sliding design. the sleeve backward like the to mesh with this so gear on the shaft to the rear wheels. The wheel is now turning at 60 revolutions a minute and the power flows through these gears.
For higher speeds, we let the power go directly to the rear wheels. We shift the sleeve forward so that it meshes with the shaft from the engine. The so power travels to straight one. from the Here engine to the drive shaft. Now the shaft to the wheels is turning at 90 revolutions a minute, the same speed as the engine. But here's a problem. An automobile must be able to go backward as well as forward. So we add one more set of gears to reverse the shaft to the rear wheels. With the gears shifted into reverse, the power travels through the transmission in a path like this. Yeah, we'll pause here. So I, I put the link to this video in the notes if you want to check out the rest because they, they even talk about th yeah this video it, it, it's really really amazing so even though this is from the 30s like it's a super intuitive explanation step by step really slow about how the things are connected and even though um, manual transmissions are more sophisticated today it's these basic things still look very much the same let me I think so I put like a picture here of a more like modern manual transmission and it looks like a little more it is more confusing but when I look at this try to think of in principle it's it's just this uh, so I would encourage you check out the rest of this video they talk about um, synchronizers next in this video to show how um, the gears can connect together without like clacking and, and having this. Uh, I'm trying to visualize how the counter shaft is changing the speed of the rear tires. Yeah, I, I have sat with these videos a lot. I, I think it's, it's hard to get this um, just on the first time you've been exposed to it, unless you've worked a lot with cars, uh, which, which I haven't, by the way. Um, <clears throat> it's a little hard to to visualize so i would i would go through this video i'd watch it a couple more times a transmission is a really 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 fascinating mechanism it's a huge um advancement the video about the differential is really amazing too yeah maybe we'll maybe we'll check that out um what's the benefit of angled teeth on the modern transmission i don't have a great understanding of that to be honest yeah, you'll notice here the the teeth are angled, whereas here it's just uh, you know straight like that. Um, guys, that wraps up the the content for today. Alcante says, "I think it reduces gear noise." Oh, it's for the noise. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you uh, putting that in there. So, okay, these slanted gears, a little less, little less noise. Um, so when we come back on Wednesday, we're going to, I'll, we'll watch a video about the, the clutch real quick. Uh, there's another, it's a, it's a really great video. I, I put this on UB Learn so you can click on these, on these links if you're wondering how to find these videos. And then, man, we are just gonna keep working our way through the powertrain and we're gonna sum the moments, the torques, and eventually we're going to get down to this expression for the tractive force. And it's going to be this monster equation, but it's, it's really great. Modern transmission systems don't look like these, as in the underlying mechanism? No, no, no. The, I think the underlying mechanism for a modern manual transmission is the same as what we see in this video they've just made some advancements like uh like the gears are angled um i i honestly tell me if i'm wrong but i, I don't think it's changed that much which is cool it tells you how uh, it's, it's a really great simple mechanism okay we need to bring back some tunes we need to bring back some tunes.
Estes. My car will be up here on the 28th of September, and they do drag racing every Wednesday night. So let me know if you want to do that experiment. Ooh. Okay, if you're curious about what this experiment is, Hank has a car which can move. And he has, um, oh, oh, so it's here, oh, until. Okay, but he has all the specs for this vehicle. So what I wanna do, I wanna use these theoretical techniques to predict how fast his car can complete, what is it, an eighth of a mile? And then I want Hank to race an eighth of a mile and see what it does. It'd be cool to see how it compares. Um, that'd be pretty sweet. Okay, let's... Um, well, even if I can't make it out there, you got to run that race and let me know what happens. Yeah. Just ran a slow time last week. Oh, yeah, we got to... Okay, we gotta you bring some friends as well. Okay, you'll get the video. Ricardo says, the step size says one mil millisecond, but when I look at the plots, it seems it is one second. Oh, no, no, Ricardo, that's just because um, on my plots, I spaced those markers at one second intervals. But if you look in between the markers, there's some curvature to that line. So I actually did it at one millisecond. For this Wednesday, you guys are gonna do it? Oh, that sounds amazing. Send me the details. I don't know if I can make it out. But you got to do it. You got to film it. Four fifty four field trip. Post the here. Post the information in the Discord. When you decide you're going out, put it in the Discord. Oh, that sounds amazing. Thank you, Hank. That's exciting. Rick says, okay, got you. That makes sense. You tried. Yeah, yeah. Don't do one second. Okay. Go Bills. Yeah. Go Bills winning their, their first game, right? No, Phil, you've done a couple of races. Ten years ago. be a part of it I think Hank is gonna post details on the discord if he can make it out and then you show up and you pay five dollars what if I want to put my Honda CRV in the race Can. 
Oh, jeez. It's it's literally only five dollars to race anything. <laughs> Shoot. They'll just let you. Okay. Paul, you want to race the shopping cart? All right, everybody. I got to run to a meeting. Uh, always a pleasure to spend Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings with you guys. I'm having a lot of fun. Hope you are. Um, have a good rest of your Monday. The shopping cart will totally win. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. You can't match the tractive force that I'm going to be putting out. All right. Bye, Jenna. Bye, everybody. See you, Chimney Snacks. Oh.